Just a couple of announcements. IEEE membership and the society membership, please become a member if you're not a member yet. Um, and uh, I usually do future seminar announcements, but we are still planning. Um, the good news is we're, um, um, we're confirming uh, two distinguished lecture seminars with um, two IEEE Slide State Circus Donald Pedersen Award winners in 2018 and 2019 uh, for um, the months of, I think, September and October. So it's coming up. Um, Dr. Steve uh, Trimbelger for FBGAs, and also um, Dr. Uh, Larry Nagel, uh, who just, the, the award was announced. This is the most prestigious award in um, SSCS society. Um, the award was just announced like a week ago or two weeks ago. So, so please check out the website and, uh, and stay tuned for that, for those. Um, <clears throat> okay, without further ado, we get to tonight's seminar. Um, we have uh, Dr. Kiran Gunnam from Western Digital, and the, the talk will be on uh, review of LADAR and localization techniques for safe autonomous driving. Uh, Kiran was actually our past chair for the SSCS Society, and uh, we are glad to have him back to give a talk for us. And just a couple of, uh, I mean, he doesn't need any introduction, but just a couple of highlights of his uh, uh, bio. He, his expertise in error correction and LDC, LDPC codes, storage and memory systems, and vision-based navigation systems. Um, he has held uh, several positions at many large and small companies, and led the uh, organization to become industry leaders through groundbreaking technologies. Kiran has uh, several patents, uh, over 100 uh, patents and publications uh, in uh, various areas of uh, algorithm, computing, and storage systems. And obviously, um, companies shipped his uh, technology in uh, billions of chips, uh, especially uh, for data storage and Wi-Fi. And uh, he also, he served as IEEE Distinguished Lecturer for, uh, I think, CAS Society in the past, uh, which is uh, one of the co-sponsors of, of this seminar, and gave uh, many conf uh, conference um, plenary talks. And also he's, a, I think, a prof uh, adjunct professor at Santa Clara University teaching classes on machine learning uh, systems. Uh, so, without further ado, let's welcome uh, uh, Dr. Kiran Gunna. Hey, thank you, Mustafa, for the invitation. And thank you all for coming here. So, actually, we didn't expect these many people because Mustafa announced it, I think, a few days back. So, give me one second. So, I would start with the review of the LiDAR. And then I would go into the, the work uh, that's being done by Apollo AI. That's uh, some of the people I knew them. So we are actually like a try to have them present, but they are not able to present. So I said, okay, let me present your work here. <laughs> so let me go here. So I'll start with the autonomous systems and then I will uh, talk on the LiDAR, the basics and who are the players. And also I'll talk about the various LiDAR architectures and uh, then I will talk about the integrated perception. So this is more of a, like a kind of, I would say like a, the, the history slide of how the LiDAR started, it basically like a 30s, Yet Singe, the has an idea of the lidar, and uh, the the first the I would say like the application for the lidar is started with atmospheric research, and in the 70s there is a Apollo 15 mission, used a lidar to map the surface of the moon. So Professor John Jenkins from Texas A&M, so he has uh, developed a precise model of the shape of the moon based on the lidar measurements, and then. There are some more applications in terms of the, he himself worked the, 
the unmanned aerial refueling and spacecraft docking these are again the, the laser applications then uh, starting again like uh, we have so many other applications like topology transportation and uh, robots and uh, the self driving cars especially from waymo and uh, so in terms of the players oops, sorry So in, in terms of the US, you can see this, this red box is essentially a robocar. So the players in the robocars is Waymo, Uber, and uh, GM, Cruise, and Lyft. And uh, similarly, they are in the USA, like Ford and GM are working on the advanced driver assistance systems. And similarly, in Europe, we have Mercedes-Benz and Navia. These are, the again, uh, the, the robotic cars. They can, each robotic car has its own limitation. They're not completely like level four. I will get into those de details in the next slide. <coughs> so similarly, there's so many car, uh, companies are working on the, the EDA systems in Europe. And similarly in China, there is a big, big push from Baidu on the robotic cars. And uh, similarly, there are several other car, the several Chinese companies are working on the EDA systems. And in Russia, we have Andex. And uh, similarly in Japan, we have several companies here. So most of you, most of the audience here, I, I assume they would know about what is a level zero to level five. This is a little bit confusing for if you are not familiar with this one, but uh, the the idea is that okay, the level zero is that you don't have any uh, essentially like the the any help from the system at all. So now this one is more you can think about is if you have a cruise function the that you have to again like uh, if you set for 60 miles per hour that car would go at 60 miles per hour even if you have obstacle in front of you so you have to intervene so in the level two the it can handle the lane holding and lane changes and uh, similarly like the uh, it, it more i think the if you have driven tesla tesla more like uh, more likely a level two system Again, some people complain that the Tesla is not even level two system, but again, we don't go into that. And then level three is a highly automated, and uh, I met some people from Waymo, so they say that level three is not needed. I think a lot of people argue against it because level three is kind of a, the, in Indian uh, mythology, we have something called a Trishan Kusvarg. That means you're in the middle, and uh, it's better to be either on the ground or in the heaven, not in the middle. So the level three is the one of the issue is that the system can drive automatically, but when it cannot handle a specific situation, it would, you have to, the human driver has to take the control immediately. So you don't have much time to respond. So that is much more dangerous. Then let's see if the human is attentive all the time, that is good. But uh, if the human is told that, okay, the system is driving, He's reading something and then all of a sudden the system says, oh, okay, you need to take control now. It will take some time for the human response to be like uh, the uh, fast at the point of time. So people are actually now def redefining level three as something more uh, a smaller subset of level four, but the, these definitions are the up to the interpretation. And uh, sorry for that. So in the level four, it is uh, fully automated. So the Waymo cars, the potentially we can classify as a level four cars. So the system can handle all the uh, situations. The, and the, when the special conditions happen, the driver has an enough advance notice. And similarly, right now, the, the one of the constraints for level four is that the those cars can be driven in a given mapped area. So that's one of the constraints that is, the definition is not captured there, but essentially like all the, the level four cars have to be driven, the current level four cars have to be, uh, have to be driven in the prior mapped areas. And in the driverless level five, you don't have a steering. So the idea is that, <laughs> the idea is that there is no driver needed. And, uh, but at the same time, actually you have a driver maybe in uh, somewhere else, like maybe in Indonesia or somewhere else. 
So you have a robotic driver that would uh, try to like oversee maybe like uh, the 50 different cars or something. There are actually some startups are trying to uh, the commercialize the technology for the remote driving. They say that, okay, you can build level five car, but if there are anything that uh, some, un some unexpected thing would happen, we have this robotic driver to take care of it. I believe that is probably more a, the like the, the better choice than simply like the, uh, having a human driver to intervene. But one of the issues is that how far, uh, how much is the connectivity in terms of the 5G that is not, the technology is not in there. So essentially the, these definitions, the are subject to change because the, there is no, like a, the precise definitions for this. And uh, so I think there is uh, several companies are lobbying SAE and other the standard setting organizations trying to say what, what is this level exactly mean. And so this is going to take some time. So in terms of the LIDAR basic principle, it is actually very simple. So essentially you have a laser beam and uh, you'll be pointing to an object. So for instance, if I'm pointing this laser beam and it gets reflected back, I have a the an optics that uh, essentially like lens that uh, collects all the energy and then focuses on the fo focuses on the photo detector and then it receives the the uh, essentially a pulse back and then the signal processing here is essentially computing the time of flight if it is a pulsar lidar system sometimes you can do a continuous wave also then you can do a phase difference and you can compute the that uh, the distance but essentially this uh, signal processing is either done in the analog or in the digital or combination of both. So it is essentially giving a distance point for one, uh, the one distance point. Now if you repeat this one across the whole space around, then you get a 360 degree point. Now how do you like uh, get this 3D point? There are so many ways you can do like 1D, 2D and 3D. There are very expensive sensors that does like more of a 2D, those are for the like for the archaeology and other purposes. And also similarly, there are several lidars that are used for the airborne drones. So those ha again have a different uh, uh, different uses. And we'll go in uh, in uh, talk more more in terms of I would say the we'll talk in terms of a 3D lidars. So that is more in terms of a the like both horizontal and vertical scanning, and the field of view is uh, typically from uh, 120 degrees to 360 degree, and there will be some short range, short range lidars that would be typically again 30 degrees, so we'll talk about them. So in terms of the time of flight lidar systems, the uh, you, we have a like a pulse modulation systems. These are more popular than any other systems. And uh, the, one of the reasons is that this doesn't have a phase ambiguity. That's one of the, uh, the uh, one of the reason. But essentially, it measures the time of flight directly. And uh, the uh, the uh, one of the thing is that you will be doing a very short uh, the uh, light pulses. Uh, typically, like uh, we transmit, I would say, typically four nanosecond to five nanoseconds, and then you would receive the pulses. You can do a the uh, essentially like an A to D converter that is operating at one gigahertz or you can do analog circuits for the time to digital conversion. And uh, so one of the issue here is that the, uh, the, if there are more LIDARs that are basically transmitting single pulse and if there are the more vehicles surrounding it, it's difficult to see whether I'm receiving the response. Let's say if I'm the, one of the vehicle, I don't know whether I'm receiving my own pulse or somebody else's pulse. So typically what uh, is done in the wireless systems is you have a CDMA, you have a coded division multiplexing access. So you have to do a similar one here in the LiDAR systems where you have a signatures and where you'll be changing your uh, signatures randomly. And uh, then the continuous wave modulation, these are the, some of the new companies are trying to do this. So the, these are the, this technique is used in rad radar. So, but again, uh, LIDAR, it is still like in infancy. So it measures the phase difference between the sent and received signals. We'll get into the, uh, some of the circuits here uh, the, in a few more slides. 
So you can do different shapes, sinusoidal, square wave. Sinusoidal is much more common. And then we'll essentially do a cross correlation to do the phase estimation. And uh, one of the things is that there, there is a phase ambiguity problem. The, the, because of this, there is a minimum distance, maximum distance, those kind of aspects. But we'll get into that later. So, the, essentially, what are the different uh, fa uh, the uh, the effects uh, of the uh, for the for the lidar systems? You have the like the, the reflectivity of the reflectivity of object is an important thing. Like, say, for instance, a lot of lidar makers would make climbs in terms of the range, but typically the range is quoted for a like a eighty percent reflectivity at a PD of ninety five percent, like probability of detection at ninety five percent. And uh, let's say, for instance, if you have a car at uh, 200 meters, and it has to be the color has to be white or something, and it, and uh, you have 80 percent of and you get one point, and the chance of getting one point is 95 percent. So, in order to be able to really get enough points that you can actually really classify that as a car, that even at 80 percent reflectivity, you're more looking at a the, the for, for that particular uh, the 900 five nanometer you're looking around 40 meters to 50 meters so the range is actually very uh, limited in most of the modern lidars there are some exceptions we'll go into that and also it depends on the weather conditions the lidar gets affected by the snow and fog and the sensor placement this is an uh, important one the uh, one of the thing I think in one of the recent accident they essentially didn't have the lidars on the side of the car on the if you have a lidar on the top of the car you have a blind spot so you can't see things that are closer to the car so you need to have a side lidars also so if you don't have side lidars you're most likely to get into an accident and the refresh rate is typically like 10 hertz to 20 hertz so this refresh rate is again depends on whether you're doing a uh, like a 360 degree or whether you're doing a like a 30 degree focused so but the refresh rate is important because if you're the like if your refresh rate is small then you cannot drive faster and the resolution uh, again it uh, the because even if you have a lot of uh, the it correlates in terms of the number of beams as i show later in terms of the waymo example they decides to take a completely different approach in order to get a resolution. So the number of beams is not the answer. So the right answer is more in the system level design. I will go into that design later. And uh, then you have a like uh, different illumination methods and different detection methods and so on. So in terms of li LiDAR detection, you can use very like uh, expensive materials to improve your uh, detector sensitivity. But again, that comes with the cost. And also, that's uh, related to material, but at the same time, the detection you can do analog the uh, analog time to digital conversion, or you can do a A to digital conversion, A to D conversion, and then you do a lot of processing in either an FPG or ASIC digital processing. So here is the kind of it's actually a, the subset of the complete lidar taxonomy. There, I have another slide for a complete lidar taxonomy. But this is more what the autonomous, the like vehicle, the lidar for autonomous vehicles on ground are looking into it. So these are more the if you start here, the you have a 1D. I think these are from IBO. I will go into the company names also later. So these are for emergency braking. So those are actually very good lidars. So those are very cheap also. So and then you have a 2D slash 3D, and uh, so you have a like, let me go into the non-scanning first because there are less items here. So in the non-scanning, you have a flash LiDAR. So flash LiDAR, again, I'll go, go into the more detail later. Essentially, you would be sending a flash of light into the environment, and then you would be collecting all the light back. And you're limited by the, like, the SNR because you won't be getting the, like, compared with a pulsar LiDAR going in a specific direction, you, you are uh, essentially flooding the entire environment. So here, the uh, you have again you can do a structured light and then the the multi cameras and stereo vision, but we'll not get into here. So I have some slides on flash light. I will get, get we'll talk more on that. So then in the scanning, you have a mechanical scanning and non mechanical scanning. So non mechanical scanning, there are a lot of issues. There is a lot of uh, I would say <coughs> the. 
irrational exuberism, I think I would say. <laughs> so, but these techniques are not yet uh, mature because if you want a long range, you really need a like uh, the essentially like more of a the macro mechanical scanning because uh, the most of these uh, like scanning techniques cannot handle that uh, large power unless you are decide to put la large uh, like expensive the uh, expensive setup for the MEMS or other, other techniques. So several companies are doing this one, but essentially the solid state LIDAR, the, my impression is that these are limited in terms of the range, and also the, these are more in terms of, I would say, the sidekick than as the main LIDAR. So they essentially would be more of as a, the, the LIDARs that you want to mount on the sides on the back of the one while you still have a top LIDAR. So then in the non-MEMS, you essentially have a micro mechanism, micro mechanical scanning and the Risley prisms, and then uh, you have a micro motion. So most of the current ones that are the uh, deployed in the production vehicles from Waymo, the uh, I would say they're the they're combination of a, the micro mechanical scanning as well as the, some of the spring mechanisms, they use a combination of techniques. So this is again another way to look at this. The, so you have the pulsar LiDAR, you have the essentially like Velodyne Value, RoboSense, and Shurstar, and uh, so many other companies here. And similarly, the other mechanical scanning, the Luminar, this uses the 1550 nanometer, and you have Panasonic here, I will get, get into this design. And similarly, the MEMS LiDAR, you have uh, different companies here, LiDAR Tech, Innovis, and RoboSense, again, I think RoboSense and Innovis have the design wins, and also the, the like, uh, LiDAR tech also have the design wins. And then in terms of the flash LiDAR, the, you have Continental, and then uh, like you have Argo, it's kind of a little bit uh, strange here, this 1350 nanometer, and people typically use 905 or 1550, but I'm not sure why they selected this one. And there is a TetraView, this is a combination of camera and LiDAR, and the continental design, a little bit go into that continental design, it's more of a fla uh, flash LiDAR design. And uh, so then you have the OPA, optical phased area LiDAR. So the Quenergy is doing that, and uh, again, the range is very limited. The RoboSense is also doing that. And uh, so then in terms of the continuous wave LiDAR, the, you have the, like essentially the, uh, like I would say, like FMCW, you have the Blackmore, and also you have the, in terms of the flash LiDAR plus FMCW, you are doing the Oryx. This is from Israel, so they have kind of a nano, the antennas, that's what their term is. And so essentially like there are uh, the m multiple, the companies, the trying to essentially like the, differentiate their product by in terms of the choosing the particular laser or the modulation technique or the the scanning uh, mechanism so again this is kind of another uh, the look in terms of the who, who are the different players in the entire ecosystem you have the different companies most of these lighter companies depend on these set of companies in terms of the photo detectors and uh, the integrated circuit, most of the people use the, the FPGAs and the A A2D converters. So FPGAs are from Xilinx, and this is uh, Intel now. And uh, similarly, you have the different companies for the laser sources, and you have different uh, companies for optical elements. So interestingly, what is happening now is that the uh, like th this is kind of the like a geography uh, uh, geographical view. But if you see, like, uh, the next slide, the, this is the kind of the, uh, in China, so Chinese government is really wants the, like, all the semiconductors as well as any of the key technologies to be developed completely in China. So they are essentially, like, uh, the, uh, there's a lot of government funding, there's a lot of money involved in, in uh, uh, especially in China. So essentially it's kind of a parallel system in China, like whatever the companies you see here, you would see the parallels there. You have Baidu that parallels Google there, Google here. And so the another interesting thing is that the, there are so many promises on LIDARs, but none, nothing is happening. So that's one of the reasons Waymo went 
and they designed its own lidar actually better lidar i would say and uh, so all the oems are actually either through mndas or the internal rnd they are essentially going for their the own lidar designs and uh, so i think i think mo most of the uh, high volume that would happen for the consumer cars they would essentially use the solid state lidar because these are the more affordable compared to the mechanical lidars so for the consumer cars most likely the 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 trend would be more like level 3 and uh, i know a lot of people don't like level 3 but i think that's what uh, the that word may be have to be refined but level 3 is the the starting point for the consumer cars and so here uh, the you have the the mem slider i would show some of the design wins so the opa lidar people expect that it might be like feasible in 2022 2023 time frame so but again i'm not sure about it <coughs> so the one of the advantages of the opa lidar is there is actually no moving parts so compared with the the mem slider there is at least a micro scanner integrated in here there is a small mirror that is moving in there so you could say that it's still a mechanical lidar but it is a micro mechanical so there are several the mem slider players ai and valio and innovis and the in china there is a robosense and uh, beanwake and lidar tech and uh, in the opa lidar players are quenergy and the blackmore and robosense again so blackmore i would say has more interesting chances because they're doing a continuous wave fm and at the same time they're trying to do kind of a spread around that so in terms of the flash lidars again there the you have again different uh, players here like argo is one thing and uh, the continental they ha uh, have a design win with volvo and uh, i'm not sure about the other companies here again the 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 advantages are no moving parts and everything and also like uh, the the main uh, the problem is here is that the signal to noise ratio is uh, like uh, uh, very bad but the the continental the they worked with the military before they say that they have some new technologies there up in their sleeve they can get a very good range so we have to see and what they but also they are planning for 2021 and so we have to see uh, like th those uh, designs in, uh, in the volvo cars and uh, so again this is kind of a the like uh, there is an exception here the for the mechanical like uh, the only exception is the google here the but all the other current mechanical lidars have these uh, like advantages and the uh, problems so they have good performance and resolution but most of them like are they are expensive like less robust and uh, weather sensitive and it's not automotive grade and uh, these are like in terms of the very limited volume you're talking in terms of the like hundreds to thousands like if the company is actually doing well but most of them like they're selling in like uh, they have let's say 50 automaker programs they probably would be selling few units to each of them so these are all uh, test vehicles so there is a huge manufacturing cost involved here you actually like most of the 50% of the employees of lidar companies are in manufacturing so that's uh, one one thing and also there is a because the designs are kind of very i would say like uh, the, the they're not ready for the automation they have the designs the more of a ad hoc design basis that's one thing and i think compared to that google has a much better design that actually they can automate the automate the production so and also all the current players mechanical are they are facing their cutthroat competition from chinese companies so that actually like uh, results in a, the razor thin profit margin so you could have like a lot of revenues but uh, you're essentially have a like a very thin profit margin sometimes you may the incur losses also so then in, in terms of the design vein the one one of the first thing the is the uh, waymo so waymo has a i would say this is inter the essentially waymo has a like internal lidar development so essentially and also they have their own uh, the uh, robot taxi that's one of the the most advanced uh, 
the robocar in the industry. Most of people would agree that there's at least two to five years ahead, depending on which one you're comparing against. <clears throat> so you have a, like uh, the Waymo has a Chrysler, the SUVs, and also they have a, they announced with the Jaguar. So it's uh, roughly like uh, one is 60,000 units, another is 20,000. So these deployment are planned by 2020, 2022. And uh, so right now, I think in California itself, I believe Google has uh, 50 cars. It could be more. I don't know the current number. In Arizona, they have more. And uh, so this is one of the uh, the bigger uh, bigger wins. So essentially, Waymo is in front of everybody, both in terms of the self-driving software stack, and uh, as well as in the like lidar space. <coughs> and then you have Valio, and Valio has a design win the Ferrari. So this is more for Adidas. And uh, so these are expected around 3,000 in 2017. So this is a, like a four beam lidar. I think those are already in production. I believe this is a 2017 number. And and then uh, they're expecting 100K by 2021. They're expecting this model would be used in other RD models also, because this one, the 3000 is an RD A8. And uh, so then you have Innoviz. So they have a design win with BMW. So again, this design win is around 100K units. This is again 2021 time frame. So they have industrial grade, they're working on auto grade. So, and then you have a Continental. So they have again design win in Volvo. They, they also basically like have a design win size of 100K 2021. Interestingly, all these companies are established players who have a better, the manufacturing process and design process who are able to get this design. So for instance, the, the Innovis has a partner, I think I forgot the partner name now, but that is uh, the Magna. So Magna has uh, worked with automotive companies for a long time. And uh, similarly, Continental is a tied one, the automotive supplier. So the companies who are able to get the design wins for the commercial products have a track record of building the high volume product. So this one, I will go a little bit detail in terms of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Waymo design. So I don't know how many, uh, have you seen this car? It's a good number. So this is a truly the first vehicle built on a mass production platform with a essentially fully integrated hardware suite and for the purpose of full autonomy. And uh, I would say it's a limited testing, but the Waymo guys may say that this is a complete testing, but, uh, the, but at least as I see, it's a still a limited testing. And uh, the one of the key, uh, but one of the key thing is that they have a like uh, the the best metric in terms of the disengagement rate. The if I remember correctly, they have uh, the one disengagement for every five thousand miles. That number might have the improved recently. So that means that the human has to intervene intervene every five thousand miles. There are the some of the uh, companies who are in the self-driving race, they have sometimes like once in 10 miles, like one in let's say the 200 miles and so on. So that's one metric. But again, there is some kind of a, the argument the people would make, okay, we are driving in San Francisco, so, but our disengagement rate means something else. So there is, there is no the agreed metric at this point of time, but one in 5,000 miles, whether you are driving in Arizona or somewhere else, but it's still a very, very good metric. So the interestingly, the Waymo has uh, the there are two lidars in this one. Originally, I thought there is only one lidar, <laughs> but actually there are two lidars here. There is a separation. The once you open the lidar, you would have you would see a, the optical separation, and also it supports the first lidar. So the first lidar is actually a 905 nanometer, 64 beam lidar. This is I would it's a, like more of a mechanical lidar. But they improved this LiDAR so much that it's so much different than the, any of the LiDARs out there. So you have, I will go into the detail in, in a little bit, but you have a single lens. It is much more manufacturable for automation, like the automatically. You don't need like 400 technicians changing the detector and LiDAR, detector and laser. So it's a completely automated. So then they have a, the second LiDAR. This is a 1550 nanometer single beam LiDAR. This is has a 300 meter range. 
So definitely these numbers are like, the, I would say at least two years back. I don't know the current numbers. John doesn't tell me those numbers. <laughs> so, but definitely these numbers are definitely improved now. So I don't know those numbers. These I would say like the, the two years back. So here you have a 1550 nanometer single beam LiDAR. I think if anybody remembers Luminar, Luminar also has a 1550 nanometer single beam LiDAR. But I will tell you the difference in the next slide. It's a very key difference. So this entire thing would cost $7,500 in limited volume. So as the volume increases, this price would come down under less than $1,000. So, but most of the, the I think, uh, let me go to the next slide and I'll talk about the cost. But essentially you have, if you see here, you have a short, short range LiDAR here on the sides and also in the, in the front. And also, it is not clear from here, but it, there is something on the back also. This one is more of a ra radar here. So, uh, essentially, they, uh, like, uh, the, like, they have the LiDARs, essentially, uh, the, like, the three, uh, four side LiDARs and uh, two main LiDARs. And also, they have, I believe, eight cameras all around the, all around the car. So they're also actually like integrated in the same uh, the same assembly, if I remember correctly here. And uh, so essentially, the lidar plus camera is integrated as one hardware piece. And also, essentially, you have a like uh, the glass. The this is a essentially like a glass shield that uh, blocks the visible light. And it lets the both the 905 and 1550 nanometer, while as this one would only let the 905 nanometer because there is no 1550 nanometer here. So this kind of this is my own kind of name here. I, I use master slave in a lot of my own designs. I have like done something called a master slave network before. So I say okay, this is a master slave lidar. So this cost is based on what Google executives mentioned, I think almost two years back now, the cost would be definitely less as the volumes are increasing. So there is a master mid-range LiDAR. So this is a 360 degree horizontal. So it has a complete uh, 360 degree surround view. And interestingly, this is only 20 degree field of view. So people would wonder, oh, okay, this is 20 degrees very less. But uh, there is a trick here, uh, I will go into it. So the range is 100 meters. As I said, again, these numbers are from two years back. So these numbers would be definitely would be improved now. So that uses the 905 nanometer, and then houses its APD in a sealed chamber with inert nitrogen gas. So that's the kind of the scale of the Google because you have a lot of experts working. <laughs> so because when people are working in LiDAR, you don't think about nitrogen gas. Okay, first of all, I don't know what nitrogen gas does. I know it's inert, but <laughs> so it has a 0.2 degree horizontal and 0.3 degree vertical angular resolution. So the resolution is not super great, but here is a trick. There is a slave steerable long range LiDAR, so that uses a 1550 15, nanometer LiDAR. So when I started working at Valid and I said, okay, we have to do some kind of a steerable LiDAR. So when I looked into the prior art, usually I look into what is there, they're already there. <laughs> so it's almost like I started looking into that kind of a, okay, can we steer the LiDAR, I think two years back, but Google has this one in 2013, so it's almost like, a, the three years before my I thought about it because <laughs> but nevertheless so what they have done is essentially it's kind of luminal design you can think that way but this is a single beam it's a 1550 nanometer and you can steer completely over 360 degree but the key is here is that you can also steer on the horizontal axis also so that's another so they use a spring mechanism so you can zoom into objects on the road based on the processing results of this master. So that is the key here. So you're not going on the madness of increasing 128 beam or 256 beam. So you're basically doing more of a, like a smart thing by saying that, okay, I can get the very the good idea in terms of what I'm looking and based on, okay, the whether the anything is interesting or whether anything is of concern, let me use this one to get more details on this one. So this process works seamlessly because they integrate the perception. That's uh, my second part of the talk. I'll talk about the Apollo AI, why, why it's very important to integrate the perception as part of the sensor because you need to be able to make these decisions faster. <coughs> so here you have a refresh rate of four heads. So this is more like a 10 heads update here. So here you have a the, like see, see here, it's a 0.1 degree horizontal compared to here 0.2 degree. 
and here you have 10 times more resolution here so here two times so essentially you would have a like 20 times more resolution here the compared to this one so you can actually really zoom in the if you see the some of the google uh, or waymo videos they can actually the sense whether a pedestrian is waving his hand or whether a, like a bicycle is waving his hand they can see the intent of that so that is that's where you need this kind of resolution but if you are trying to go in terms of a, the like 128 or 250 kind of craziness you probably would be the spending a lot of uh, the i would show another another slide from apollo 8 it's kind of the king of the hill game you want to drive your product towards the like a low cost but you don't want to drive your product towards the high cost so if you're going in terms of the 128 beam and 256 beam you're driving the cost up not down but this is more of a very uh, intelligent smart design so then essentially th this one as i said right th this can essentially rotate on the vertical as well as the horizontal axis and uh, and also if you see here this uh, the the one of the the 15 50 nanometer designs are 120 degree but you don't need to have a 120 degree field of view that means your power requirements are much less you have a much smaller lidar so essentially you can the like uh, the essentially you don't need to pay 100k for both of them you are paying like 7500 if you want to get both of them you have to pay 200k <laughs> so that's what i was asking john okay do you guys have plan to sell your lidar to others <laughs> So I think uh, John is from Waymo. So basically, like uh, the, but I think because right now I think uh, Waymo has the best lidar designs compared to anybody else. I would say at least uh, three or four more years ahead than the than the players. The same thing in the in the software as well. So the uh, because if I basically if somebody looks into this one, they think that oh okay there is something like a, a one lidar there, but nobody expects it's a two lidar. So anyway, let's get into the 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 compare this kind of more of a table comparison here. So you have a 300 meter range the for the long range, and uh, so one thing I'm not sure here is that this is uh, like I think the this 300 meter is it quoted for the 80 percent reflectivity or 10 percent re reflectivity, and uh, but I believe this is for the 80 percent reflectivity. Yes. Uh, what, what is that again? Could you? Why you need 300 meters mm -hmm. for something that is to 100 meters? That's a good question. Because when you are seeing at 100 meter, you're still getting, you, essentially, let's say you are the, have some points from 100 meters, right? But you still, the, uh, let me probably say this way. Let's say if you have a car at a 300 meters, and uh, now you want to recognize that, but you still get a like a, the one or two points in the 100 meter lidar. So it's not that you're not getting any points at all. So now you want to essentially like uh, increase uh, your resolution so that you get more points using the 300 meter lidar. So uh, what I meant to say is that when you say there is a, this particular this uh, this particular the configuration. When the, there is a hundred meter, the one it is actually you still get more points beyond hundred meters. Does it answer your question? Not really. Not really. Okay. <laughs> John, do you want to explain more? Do you have any? Okay. No, no, I think let me probably say this way. Let's say if you have seen a black tire on a highway, right? And then you get some points with the 100 meter lidar. And uh, now you want to see what is exactly it is, right? Is it a simply a paper or a black tire or a black paper? So then you can use this long range lidar to see what it is. So you really need to see actual data. Yeah, at least I've seen the actual data. You can, because it's 100 meter lidar, what data I see. And uh, I always said, okay, I want to have a more resolution on that. We can take it offline if you have still more questions. Most of the cars know the geometry of the road quite precisely. And they can be looking at the end of the road and all that stuff. And therefore, you know, the road is Yes, but at the same time, this 300 meter LiDAR the, is a like a limited field of view. Say, for instance, this one is a 8 degree, 8 degree horizontal and 15 degree vertical. So you cannot look at all the 360 degrees. You are selectively looking 
particular regions. Yeah, but the road ahead of you is 120 degree field of view. It is not 8 degree. Uh, okay, if you, you're saying that, okay, yeah, that, that's like, yeah, if you're looking in front of you, that is fine, but what about, let's say, if there is a, like, uh, the, like, another car at the intersection that is coming towards, fa fa fast towards you, right, and then you detect only few points at the 100 meter LIDAR, you really want to see what it is, whether it's a noise sample or a ca fast moving car. Yes, but you all want to have your redundancy. It's not that you don't want to just uh, depend on the, the one modality of the sensor. Yeah, yeah, you, you, could, you could use a camera. You could, you. Yes, yeah. but the key aspect is a camera, if it is, let's say, the raining or if it is a bad weather, your camera cannot see much. Yes, exactly, yeah. And also computer vision, it cannot generalize that well. Say for instance, if you have a Google Net, say for instance, right, it is trained for image net. If you show Obama a picture, then it would say, oh, okay, it is a necktie, not a person. So there is limitations in terms of the computer vision as, as, uh, based on the cameras. So the, 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 how much it can generalize is very limited. You can move it around, that is the key thing. Because you can move it around a complete 360 degree to zoom in. So essentially the beam steering is an assembly movement plus spring. And uh, so you have number of beams is one. And also another, uh, the distinguishing design is the, there is only one shared lens for both the transmit and receive. And uh, so then the medium, uh, medium range LiDAR is the, 100 meters and 305 uh, nanometers. And uh, you I think this is the same specs I mentioned in the previous slide. So here you're moving the entire housing the, the, to get a 360 degree. So in the short range LiDAR, the, uh, the, you have a solid state beam steering, and then you have a four heads, and the field of view is actually 270 degrees. This is actually much higher than any of the solid state LiDARs that are in the market. So most of the solid state LiDARs are 120 degree field of view. Yes, yeah, because you need a very detailed uh, resolution because you want to really, like, let's say, as I mentioned, like, if a cyclist is going or, like, you want to see, detect his hand movement, so you need a lot, lot more resolution. Okay. So this is kind of a block diagram of the LiDAR from the Waymo. So essentially you have the, as I said, there is only one lens that is shared. So you have, a, I'll show the actual, the assembly also in the next slide. So you have the, the culminated light beams that are going out and also the reflected light that is coming back. And this lens is focusing the received light. And similarly, this lens is also doing the culmination also. And there is a shared space in terms of physical space. It's more easier if I show the next picture. So then you have a like a focused light that is going to the detector. As I said, there is a this is a sealed in a like inert nitrogen. And in terms of the transmit, they are going through an, the exit aperture. There is a mirror here. So this mirror is the one that, uh, one that gets moved. Let me see in terms of my time where I am. So essentially, this uh, the 250 here is kind of uh, diff uh, the is the uh, the uh, essentially like the 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 lens, and uh, now what you have is like uh, the it's difficult to see these numbers here, but uh, essentially the if you see here there is let me show you here the 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 224 the is a mirror. Let me find out where the 224 is here. Yeah, this is a mirror. So these are the laser uh, lasers that are the, the example is shown for three beams here. So this is the 
this is the mirror and then this is the exit aperture that uh, 226 is the exit aperture so then this 244 is the one that is provides the separation between the the uh, the transmit and the receive so the receive is here so as the receive light is coming through the lens and uh, they essentially like uh, the the 244 let me see what is it? this is the wall for the optical isolation so as i mentioned before and uh, there should be a like uh, the the as the uh, as the energy is the coming that, that should be like uh, focused on these detectors so these ones let me show here that uh, it's kind of difficult to see that this is like the the it's more of a focal surface but it's not a, re, a re actual physical thing and uh, what you would have the this A to C are the different detectors. So you could think about it's more like a, the, the the same shape you are seeing on the uh, on the uh, on the car before the like everything the corresponds to the shape here. So they essentially like in this one they have the two lidars. So the one LiDAR, that's what I'm showing the cross section there. Yes. Yeah. So then this is a shared lens. I think there is so much fight on this, I believe, but uh, the Google has the patent. And uh, so, <clears throat> The, again, there are more details. I'm not an optics person here, but uh, this the 250. Basically, what they are saying is that there is a toroidal surface 254, and uh, because that is the one, the let's say there is a like aspheric surface 252 facing the outside of the one. So it basically the it, the inside surface is for the transmit to culminate. The outside surface is for the receiving. So the shared lens is used for both. And uh, so the three different functions of the shared one. So the one of the why the, why this is so much uh, the critical for Google design because you don't need to the worry too much about the alignment between the detector and the laser as long as you have this 3D design correctly done here. So these are manufacturable. It is easy to manufacture rather than having two lenses. There is an optical separation, so this the 244 is optical se the separation. So there is no like uh, the like the, the, yeah from the lens. The I think the way the the coded the surface is that the you don't have the back reflections. At the same time, there is a blind spot. The like all these uh, lidars have a blind spot. The essentially like uh, I don't know exactly what, what what is this for this one, but uh, typically like a I think one meter or something, you cannot see something very close by because you would be ignoring any of the early returns from the lens. So the three main functions here, so it collimates the, the, for the transmission, it collects the light and also it focuses the, the collector light. And uh, so basically there is a 234 is the, the entrance aperture and this one is the 226 is the exit aperture. And uh, so the whole thing is the housing here. So it's a very, uh, very good design and manufacturable at, um, uh, at scale. <coughs> so any more questions before moving into the next design? The interestingly, the like uh, the this one is more yeah this one is more of a master one right but uh, the same the same similar design you can use for the for, for the slave lidar also because now instead of having three lidars you have one lidar but at the same time what I'm mentioning is a one beam that is almost two years back now they might be using two two lidars also in the slave lidar right? two two beams also in there so this design is uh, scalable for the whether you use fifteen fifty or nine hundred five nanometer. Yes. What is the, actual number? the I think I showed you in the previous table, right? Like sixty-four and one. Sixty-four for the master. The sixty-four for the master. This is the medium range, and then the for the long range lidar, it is one. No, no. I think here what you would have, you have sixty-four. 
the lasers and 64 detectors. Here you have, uh, let me say, you have one la uh, laser detector pair. Here you have 64 laser detector pair. Yes, yeah, the, this one, that 64, this is more like, uh, this rotates around. So there is a, like a, uh, let me see here. So the, I think in this picture, uh, the, it was difficult to see, but uh, the, the, this whole assembly moves around in, uh, in, on a vertical axis inside. So this doesn't have a horizontal movement, but this has a, the vertical one. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it is basically you can uh, yeah it can rotate 360 degree. Yeah, the two mechanisms. Yeah. yeah, these are all pulsed. The 64 again, I don't know the internal design of the VMO, right? But uh, typically they are the fired the like let's say usually like uh, 16 or 32 at a time. But usually there is a very small time separation. But for all practical purposes, you can think they are all fired at the same time. Okay, 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 if they're coming, but again, like you, we are talking in terms of the gigahertz here, right? We're not talking in terms of the, hu the human scale. You, you're essentially, let's say, the, like in terms of the points per second, the 64 beam LiDAR can collect 1.3 million points. So the, for, the, for the single beam LiDAR, I didn't count uh, how, many, how many points it is collecting at four hertz, but there is a lot more thing you can, uh, the, the, uh, you have time to respond to cater to multiple objects. Yes. Yes, yeah, that, that's a, like essentially the short range is, uh, is a solid state beam steering. So this is what, uh, again, my uh, understanding, I could be wrong, but uh, th this, the given the range, it, the range is 30 meters for this one. I'm not sure whether I kept that information here, but the short uh, short range, the range of the short uh, short range lighter is 30 meters. So more, I would guess it is more of a solid state lighter than a mechanical lighter. So let's see here. Okay, so then we have the scalar. So this one is a design win in the like RD. And uh, this is the from the IBO and then uh, believe uh, Valio, I believe the, the company. And uh, so essentially, again, this is more of a like uh, the this is still uh, I would say like more of a mechanical lidar. There is a mirror that uh, moves around, but uh, again, they they have the history of building the the automotive products. Uh, got the design right. So this is probably one thing they are able to do something closer to Google, I would say. I think the, here also, I believe uh, the like uh, they are sharing the same lens, I believe. But again, I, I don't know enough details about this one. So, but again, this is also good design that, that has a design win. So I believe they are using the LiDAR tech. This is kind of a reference design. I believe they are using not the, this, uh, the separate lens and everything. But they're using more in terms of the, the LiDAR core IC, what it does is it does the hierarchical sampling on the using a ADC and then does the digital signal processing for the pulse, pulse LiDAR. So essentially the, the LiDAR tech is a Canadian company. They essentially supply the integrated circuits for different LiDAR makers. So then there is one interesting design that's uh, worth of mentioning. This is a 3D LiDAR. I think, uh, I believe this is also like inspired by Google in one sense. So they, they basically like have a like horizontal rotation and up and down movement, similar to one of the, the long range LiDAR of Google. So 
the if you see that the design looks very simple actually for the like you have a laser diode okay that is come the you have one mirror here and another mirror here or you're sending some light and you're receiving some light through these ones and then uh, the like you're rotating these mirrors through the different motors so it looks very simple but uh, there are a lot more things that go in go into getting into the production ready So I think one thing I didn't mention is that there are almost 50 different LiDAR companies right now that are active in terms of making the LiDARs. So this is also have a, like uh, this uh, hierarchy, the, the multi-resolution scan. So they do a quick scan in the narrow range and uh, th then also you can do a quick scan in the wide range. So here there is more resolution, here there is less resolution. Then if you detect an obstacle, then you can change the scanning range and resolution. If you see this example, they are deploying this in the warehouses. So one of the main applications for the LiDAR now is happening in the warehouses. Amazon is one of the biggest customers and also JD dot, uh, JDX is also the one of the biggest customers, Alibaba. So these all want the LiDARs in the, uh, in the warehouses. And sometimes people say that actually you can do a camera also, but again, it's always a the eternal debate, but the camera is always the, the, like you do not have guarantees on the vision, depending on the what conditions you are seeing. While as for the LiDAR, you get a 3D measurements instantly without doing any processing. <coughs> I think this is more in terms of the specifications. They have a, like a 270 degree horizontal and zero to 16 vertical degree, vertical direction. So it's kind of variable. So they have also tunable. And uh, you can choose the resolution the, among these three one. So detectable distance is uh, 50 meters. As I said, that their first design win is more for the warehouses, not for the automotive. Now they're working on automotive. And the frame rate is 5 to 25. And uh, this is one of the, their stronger points. They have a like, very good ambient light immunity. I believe that comes from their filter uh, in terms of the housing. And uh, let's see. So in terms of the detection for pulse LiDAR, you can do a, like a ADC and a matched filter. So ADC is essentially capturing the entire full waveform and uh, then you are essentially like uh, the using a trans impedance amplifier to have a good amplification on that and then you have a detector, the detector the like the, uh, the, the sorry you have an ADC after TIA and then in the you're doing all the digital signal processing in the FPGA or an ASIC. So one of the key things here is that with the ADC, what is the advantage is that you have a complete uh, the waveform. So you can actually do a lot of more complex signal processing to improve your range. So the, and also another thing is that you don't necessarily need to have a, the, the automatic gain control in, in the receive path. The one, one of the advantage, but the problem with the ADC is that let's say if you have a 64 channels, the having a one giga samples per second uh, ADCs, like even two of them, even if you're sharing them, typically you have only two channels even for 64 beam or even less than four channels. Those four channels are very expensive. So what Google has done is that they went for the, the time to digital conversion almost five years back. <laughs> again, like they were well ahead of anybody else again. So then I think this is more of a range equation I won't go into here and so this is more in terms of talking about, okay, the, the if you do a, like a, the peak detector, this is what you get. And uh, the, if you do a matched filter, this is the, essentially the, uh, the performance you get. This is more in terms of the, like error fraction of a pulse length, and this is a signal to noise ratio. So interestingly, most of the LiDAR designs, like uh, the, uh, especially when I joined, they're still using a peak detector. So mash filter is a very simple technique, any single processing guy would do. And uh, so it's kind of, kind, kind of interesting that the, the, I would say that, oh, I'm the, I work on the mash filter. <laughs> but, but it's kind of what I'm saying is the most of the LiDAR makers, they are more focused on the board design as compared to a more of a system level design. So then you have a, the, you can do a time to digital con conversion, right? But again, there are the same issues that are with the ADC, but these are more pronounced for TDC. 
So you need to have AGC also here, but again, I won't go into these uh, uh, the issues here. I don't think I have enough time here, but in terms of the, there are several ways you can do in the time to digital conversion. You can have a coarse interpolation in terms of the, the measuring the time, and then you can have a fine interpolator to exactly measure, okay, what is the, 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 the time of the return pulse. So again, this is a, like uh, the, the, the another one, like some of the people implemented in FPGA itself, we can have a actual different, uh, the delays in the FPGA. I believe Luminar implemented in, in the FPGA, they had a, the different uh, buffers in the, like to have a, this kind of a conversion. But typically you, you could implement this in the analog circuits. And, uh, but again, this is kind of a, uh, the another design Again, you have a like uh, the coarse quantizer and loop counter here, and here you have a fine control. So this is how you are getting this. But again, one of the key thing uh, I'm missing here is that you have to actually calibrate these circuits. That's one of the hardest part. So how do you calibrate that? And also that calibration has to be done automatically. So th those issues are m m much more uh, the important, but I don't think a lot of LiDAR makers are working on that. They're simply trying to first of all build these circuits, but the, the calibration is more very important. And uh, so how do you improve the accuracy, right? If you want to, the really, the, the these are, I think these improvements are more, I would say, like important. If you are using a more of a, like LiDARs for the archeology span and other applications where you need a, very accurate uh, the uh, the measurements. So here, what you can do is that you can do multiple pulses with the different durations. So this is more of a time to voltage conversion, and then you get different voltages based on the time duration, and you can take the ratio to get actual uh, actual time of the that corresponds to the distance. And uh, I won't go into this equation here. This is the kind of the relation here. The, in terms of the T pulse and uh, what is the voltage that is accumulated in the first pulse and the second pulse. And uh, I will skip on this. And uh, then I think moving to the FMCW liner, this is kind of very interesting one. This is funded by both the Toyota and BMW. There is so much interest in the lidars from the, uh, the OEMs, the, precisely because of two reasons. Google is well ahead of everybody. And, but nobody has any working design, so automotive makers are very worried that, okay, <laughs> they want uh, some working LiDAR design. So they're essentially putting all the efforts in terms of the funding the companies and trying to do their own designs. So this is a very simple concept in terms of the FMCW LiDAR. So you have essentially the, you transmit a, a one waveform with one frequency. And then because of the Doppler effect, if the target is moving, you get a, the, like a slightly the, the similar frequency, but with a different phase offset. And then you mix both of them, and then you can do the, essentially do a low pass filter, and you can do the A to D, and then you can determine the phase. So this is again a traditional DSP that people do in the, in the radar all the time. Which one? No, no, I didn't show the optics, optics here, yeah. This. That's what I'm saying. The, the flow is the the, the signal. The, I here the, what I'm showing is the the signal processing path. That's exactly the same as the wireless. There is no difference. It is now instead of the having the like wireless signal, you are transmitting a light, and uh, instead of antenna, you have a lens. And the goal is to get speed and distance. Yes, yeah, speed and distance. Yeah. So here, the compared to the pulsed lidar, you get only the distance and reflectivity, but here you get both the, like uh, the, uh, you, I don't think you get the reflectivity, you get the, you, know, you get the speed and uh, you get the distance. Uh, that I'm not sure, the, I didn't remember this one, but typically I believe this is, uh, I, I, I don't think I remember that, but yeah. Yeah, very similar, yeah. Yes, yeah. So here, right, the, uh, for instance, like when you're modulating the light, uh, the light, the, the, actually I've done one, mo one modulated light before, that is typically I did only like a 40 kilohertz. 
So you don't need to really go in terms of the gigahertz on this one. You're more like you need to be able to separate the, the light the versus the ambient light. That's one of the, uh, the, the reasons you're putting the modulation on the top of it. So you don't necessarily need, uh, what I'm trying to say is that you don't necessarily need to go into, into the gigahertz range. The, uh, that's a good question. I think there is a, like, uh, again, I didn't work on this one, so I don't, uh, I don't think I can answer that question. But typically, what would happen is that the, when you are the sweeping, right, the, you want to basically, again, uh, come back to the next one. So if you don't have the, the let, let me show, basically, like you have a, the up ramp and down ramp. And if you're not ramping up fast enough in terms of the frequency change, so then uh, the, you don't have enough resolution. So you need to have a, like a higher ramp up frequency and a higher down ramp frequency. The, just a quick comment, uh, Kiran, it would be better if you just uh, answer the question at the end. Okay, sure, yeah. Yeah, thanks, because we're running out of time. Okay, so let me skip on this one. So essentially what is being done here is that you are the sending a, like a, the you're increasing the frequency and decreasing the frequency. So it's a triangular waveform you're sending here. And uh, then this is the, the received waveform here. Okay, let me skip that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this is the more on the optical phase array. I don't think I would have enough uh, time on this one, but this is kind of the design from the Quanergy. So in terms of the steering, the uh, kind of again more on the, uh, the radar principle, they try to steer the beam. And they have a single photon avalanche diode, but one of the issue is that they, they're counting essentially the, the how many photons they got, and then they do a histogram based on that spad array. But one of the issues is that uh, the, they have in terms of a, like uh, the signal to noise ratio problem, so typically the range is very limited. So typically the range is like uh, 30 meters to 40 meters. And uh, so let me go, I think any, any other questions here at this time? So I think this, this is basically the work done by Apollo AI. I know these people for a long time. So, so Professor John Jenkins is one of the uh, one of the key people involved here, and uh, Dr. Koji. And so basically, the, what they're essentially trying to the, do is more in terms of the integrating the perception in terms of the lidar. They're working with the the several uh, lidar companies and call OEMs. So more, I would say that this is a integrated the like uh, integration of the perception into the lidar so that uh, the like you don't instead of going for a very expensive lidars the like can you get a better resolution by integrating the perception so that's one of the uh, one of the main goals so here uh, the this is more in terms of the sh uh, showing okay, where uh, you need essentially these multiple uh, sensors both uh, the long range radar and the short range and also you need the lidar and camera and what are those uh, like operating uh, operating regions on this? And uh, so essentially, if you see in terms of the like just only detect only based on the camera, so I would say object detection is more of a medium. And uh, the uh, the the I believe in terms of the cost, they say high for EDAS because you're using 12 cameras or like HD cameras that are still high, like five thousand dollars. So because you don't want to spend five thousand dollars for an EDAS system. And uh, the, the, for radar, it is actually very low right now. Most of the cars you can buy, actually they have the radar for emergency braking. And LiDAR is again super high right now, and the range is 100 meters. And for autonomous requirement, you need uh, essentially the full range, and you need all these metrics uh, to be good. But the, these three different sensors provide a mix of the different things, so you want to combine these three modalities into making uh, making one uh, one sensing mechanism. So I think this kind of one interesting uh, one, this game of the king of the hill. So essentially, if you have a low cost, low detection, it would be here, medium cost, medium detection, high detection, high cost. 
So you want to go towards this one. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to say, okay, can we make the sensors towards low cost and high detection? So because most of the companies in the LiDAR space are here, high detection, high cost. So you can make a small volume, but you cannot really make into the, the commercial one. And uh, so the fixed beam LiDAR is here, the scanning LiDAR is here, and then you have the vision park assist is here. So anyway, I don't think uh, the, uh, we'll go into the details here. So you essentially, uh, uh, their claim is that you need a integrated perception to climb the autonomous seal. So you need to be able to do the detection measurement. These features have to be integrated as part of the LiDAR because right now most of the LiDARs are giving only the raw data. And uh, so this is more in terms of their stack, the object processing and localization and SLAM. And let me skip over this. And uh, they have the SLAM for LiDAR and LiDAR plus camera. And uh, so they have some new IP in terms of the object detection, tracking and classification. And also they have a, the, a new CNN for the, the co-registering camera and LiDAR and doing the object detection. And then they do a decision fusion here. I believe the, in terms of what they have, we can show, you can see a video here. So they have a mapping stack and then object processing stack. So they essentially, one of the key, uh, key goal is that they started working with these companies like Renesis and other companies. So instead of using a, like expensive GPUs or expensive computers, can you run this additional perception processing that is needed for LiDAR in the low cost computing so that they can be integrated as part of the LiDAR? So, can you play a demo there? So basically, essentially what they're trying to do is that, okay, can they do the, so the SLAM and object processing and tracking on the, the, like in a low cost processor so that that can be integrated in the LiDAR. So any questions? Can Actually, you? we have running mics, so if you could just raise your hands and wait for the mic. So thank you. Uh, the question is, is there a good solution for like a, Fog weather, is there any LiDAR that can work? Which one, which one? Hey, go ahead. What, what? Under fog. Foggy weather. Foggy weather. F faulty LiDAR? Oh, oh, fog. Fog. oh, fog, okay, okay. Uh, the, I think the, even the, uh, the VMO the, does take care of the fog in the, after the LiDAR, uh, after the, getting the actual data. So it's difficult to the, like, the actively take care of the fog. You can, once you get the return data, right, you have multiple returns, you can easily like, process those echoes and see what is fog or not. So you can also actually do a, the, a simple CNN also to remove, the, to remove the background and fog. So early on you said that uh, most LiDAR vendors we're doing a CDMA style approach to scramble their signals to avoid interference. Interference isn't really a big problem, so I'm not aware of a lot of people doing that. Who do you know is doing that? Uh, okay, the, like the, uh, at least I work on the crosstalk interference because when you're the, dealing with multiple cars, 
the that are deployed let's say if you have the few uh, few self driving cars that are around each other then you need to hand, you need to deal with the interference not really because you only get interference if you look at exactly the same spot at the same microsecond mm -hmm. now you are seeing a million points in a second so you will get a few but you don't no, get a lot no actually you get uh, you get a crosstalk interference i think uh, the 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 uh, definitely i know that waymo has that crosstalk interference and there are several other players also have okay so they they're doing it once you more vehicles you definitely see that so who else is doing it gm cruise they have a lot of vehicles whoever has a lot of vehicles they they see that problem so either they handle in the firmware they or they do in the uh, in, in the firmware not in the lidar then you can do in the li lidar also because the other reason this got discussed is that some folks developed an attack on lidars where if you are trans if you know the properties of the lidar you can create ghost objects within it it's a fairly theoretical attack although they did demonstrate it uh, and so if you can of course make your lidar unpredictable you're immune to that sort of attack so that's actually what I was more interested. Do you know anyone who has gone that far now? Oh, in terms of the addressing the the ghost attacks on the line. Yeah, I think that 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 particular one also you can uh, handle through the post processing after getting the point cloud. The there is another thing what you can do is that the you can again the handle through the multiple signatures because it's very difficult to get the same exact signature if you're going on the signature based approach. Yeah, if you're doing it. Yeah. So I just wondered who you knew who was doing it. Okay. With the CDMA style, uh, the ones that you're talking about, LIDARs, even FMCW, if you actually have lasers and, fo and detectors that can actually switch at a much higher frequency, is that an advantage? Okay, if you have a fa the diodes that can be switched faster. Right. Yeah, that's always an advantage, but at the same time, the like because they always, like, uh, the, let's say you charge a laser diode, right, and then you fire it. And then the, you need to give some time the, for it to be completely discharged, and then you would charge again. So there is always a like a time uh, time constraints associated with it. If you are improving it, that's always a good. So are you a lidar, like are you a laser maker or something? No, I'm not. <laughs> it's just a question. Okay. And does that help for the FMCW as well? The FMCW also, I think it, it would help because you can go for the higher frequency. Again, as I said, I, I didn't work on FMCW, so I'm kind of completely not. The aware of what frequencies they're used and everything, so I know the general concept only. How do you, how do you compare the wave-based uh, versus the laser-based uh, lighters in terms of accuracy, cost, uh, and variety of other? What what are the two lighters? Uh, the wave-based and the laser-based. You said laser. the one the one that's forty kilohertz uh, sends a signal versus the the laser-based pulses. Oh, pulse. Okay, you are asking yeah. about pulse-based and continuous wave, right? Continuous, yeah. So the the continuous wave, you get the velocity, but most of the like uh, there is a phase ambiguity associated with the continuous wave lidar, and also there is a lot more processing has to be done. Actually, Intel has a like a receiver and optics design for now. If you remember, I think those are in terms of gigahertz actually. So the those are basically those circuits are very complex and expensive. So those are gigahertz actually. So I yeah, previously mentioned some kilohertz, but kilohertz is for a different application. But you have in terms of gigahertz, so those circuits are very expensive. So the I think the the those will take some more time. I would say like a lot more time compared with the pulse lidar. This is just out of curiosity. You uh, combine two presentations. One is basically about LiDAR hardware yes, yes. and Apollo AI. Yes, yes. So what are those relationships? You already mentioned that Apollo AI is using that, but is there any specific reason that oh, okay, Apollo okay. We, AI We actually there? wanted to have them present here. We couldn't get their schedule. But I said, OK, let me present some of their work here. So that's the reason. <laughs> Uh, point clouds from laser scanning can be very noisy. Uh, 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 
what are the metrics of point cloud quality uh, and what uh, well what what are criteria you use to select, to choose the laser uh, laser scanner for uh, your de detection and slam so your question is that the point cloud is the very noisy, right? Yes, uh, point cloud uh, ca can be noisy. Uh, there can be many outliers. Uh, and, uh, um, the measurements can be n n not accurate. I believe it, it all may, uh, may affect the quality of uh, your slam and detection algorithms. Uh, so um, could, could you could you in few words uh, yes. uh, t tell? What yeah, in in the slam, typically there are more uh, the metrics you can use to qualify whether those points are good or not. Let's say any points that are like uh, the 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 I would say the like uh, parallel to the the laser beams, the direction you are shooting, you may not want to consider those points. And similarly, what you can do is that when you are getting the information from the lidar how well it is above a threshold, you can get that as a reliability information. So you can always uh, the, choose not to process those points or give you a less weight on those points. But typically like when you are the, getting a LiDAR raw point cloud, you don't have that reliability information. But let's say if a Google or somebody, they, they want the entire thing so they can easily take a look at the reliability information and then process it. I'm trying to figure out if he just asked my question or not, but I, I was asking to have you uh, speak a little bit more about the Apollo AI and the point cloud interface. Um, if you throw, basically you throw a point cloud and then you throw a clipping rectangle and it has a library of shapes that's predefined, or do you, or is this just a framework for you to develop your own? The, I believe what they're doing is they're doing a slam. The, I think that LiDAR is, I believe, Oster LiDAR. And uh, so they can process the LiDAR point cloud, they can do the SLAM, and also they can do the object detection and tracking using that point cloud. It's kind of a ROS package, and you can port it to the different, uh, the, the operating system. Usually OEMs use uh, the other than ROS because of the stability issues, but uh, it's a, like essentially a software package that can do the localization and uh, object detection and tracking. It, is your, um Slide deck available? Are you going to send that out? The, or make yeah, it I need available? to check, but I will uh, talk with Mustafa later. And most likely, I think I should be able to the the release that. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks. Thank you for your talk. You probably put it on the website with the video slides and video on the website. Okay. Uh, so we've been working on right here, uh, uh, lidar annotation and visualization and registering multiple lidars and things like that. Uh, for the Apollo AI system, do you know for classification and tracking if they're using neural networks or classical methods and clustering yeah, the, or both? Yeah, um, I think they're using the both. Let me see here. They're using both the classic machine learning as well as the neural network approach. So one of the advantages with the classic approach is, sorry, I think I have to go all the way to 60. The, Yeah, I think I'm wondering if you know yeah, I think, yeah, any, I think that, any metrics of how what's the precision and recall values of their LiDAR based Yeah, networks. I don't know those numbers. I just said like I know those people. I don't know the, 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 the specific metrics. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Front. I just have a, a question on the, for LiDAR, the range estimates that you use. Uh, what um, what limits that range? Is it the availability of high enough power uh, lasers or is it the eye safety or something else? Uh, I would say both. Let's say if you're using the 905 nanometer, you have to be a class A. The, you have to satisfy that safety so you cannot uh, put more power. And uh, so typically the peak power of the laser diodes is 75 watts, if I remember correctly. And uh, are available to use at longer distances. It's just it's not isolated. Yeah, not legally. You can do in the parking lot. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you can buy it. You burn out your eyes, otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's not a technical limitation. It's a it's a safety eye safety. It's a safety, but for fifteen fifty, you can go as high as you want. No, there are there are FDI regulations. 
Yeah, 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 but you can yeah, go lot higher. Yeah, maybe ten times higher. Yeah. It so doesn't for, transmit to the back of the eye, the yes, 1550, yeah. so it doesn't concentrate the light that hits the corn. It's exactly. Yeah. So for 1550, one of the issues is that the how much power you want to put into the one sensor, right? Because you, you have a finite amount of power on the car, so even though you want to put more power, that is limited. Hey, if uh, we, we already Person. ran out of time, so let's keep the, the rest of the questions uh, offline, you could ask, I think Kiran would be, will be around for a couple more minutes. So let's uh, thank our speaker one more time. Uh, as for the material and video and the slides, we, uh, we put it on the website. Uh, if you just search uh, Silicon Valley SSCS Society, and uh, it's gonna be available under uh, previous events, previous seminars. And as for previous uh, seminars we've had in the past, usually like all the videos and the slides, most of them are available online. Uh, please check out the website for future events. We will have, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, IEEE SSCS uh, uh, Donald Peterson Award winners for 2018 and 2019, uh, which is basically Nobel Prize in Chip Design uh, in the upcoming months. So let's uh, conclude the seminar. Thank you.